Hello and um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the third of our series um, uh, on uh, in the Bank Board Academy to uh, today's online debate um, on credit risk after COVID. And uh, in this context, I'd like to also thank uh, Oliver Weiman for helping us to organize the seminar. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm uh, Thorsten Beck. Um, I will be chairing this debate today. Um, I'm currently Professor of Banking and Finance at the Business School, formerly CAS in London, uh, but will join the amazing team at the Florence uh, School in March as the new director, and in September move to the EUI as chair in financial stability. Now, before um, I introduce the speakers, let me just um, give you some background um, on this uh, uh, the, the seminar and the, the broader context in which the seminar takes place. Um, today's event is uh, part of a new seminar series called uh, Challenges for Bank Board Members, uh, for, uh, which will lead up to uh, training um, or in, the, in a um, FBF Bank Board Academy for non-executive uh, uh, board members in June and uh, October. But before talking about that, let me briefly mention, uh, as I mentioned, this is the third seminar. We had two in December. Um, two very exciting ones, and we have uh, one coming up in February for which the uh, registration is already open on uh, fit and proper assessment. Um, and then uh, in March, low interest rates, April, um, possible bank consolidation in Europe, May, um, a conversation between bank board members and uh, policy makers uh, in this context also with, uh, um, we were very happy to have convinced Andrea Inria to uh, join us. Um, now, all of these are kind of open and free. Um, we have then, this leads up to, as I just mentioned, to two uh, training events uh, that we have. Uh, one in June, which is going to be online, um, sitting on boards, better check and controls of risks. Um, again, specifically for non-executive uh, directors of banks. Um, and then um, subject, of course, to uh, circumstances. Um, a residential training in beautiful Florence um, in uh, early October for three days, uh, sitting on boards, better quality and uh, better governance. Um, more information available on our website, um, uh, at, on the uh, FBF uh, website. Um, the overall goal of this um, uh, of the seminar series of the uh, Academy is uh, to build a community of board members that can interact among themselves and with the authorities that discuss openly and share practices, of course, in the on the background that uh, um, governance is a critical element of uh, good banking and the role of non-executive director is a very critical one in this context. Now, before coming to today's uh, seminar, let me just briefly make uh, um, some marketing. Um, uh, next, we, uh, FBF offers a uh, lots of different events, seminars. Uh, next week, we have a, an exciting one on big tech and fintech credit risks and benefits um, uh, same day of the week, next Thursday, same time, more information on our website. Um, now, having said this, let me then turn to um, today's seminar. Um, and of course, uh, credit risk is a topic that is um, that is that has come back on the agenda due to COVID-19 um, and will stay on the agenda probably for some time. Um, there are lots of different dimensions onto it. Today, we're gonna focus specifically on risk management, and preparing for a possible wave on uh, non-performing assets. Um, and uh, we know, of course, uh, over the past uh, 10 months or so, bank supervisors have provided uh, lots of guidance on credit risk identification and measurement in the specific context of the pandemic, a unique uh, shock, um, and are requiring also boards, bank boards, to engage with management on this matter. Um, so again, lots of dimension to credit risk. Today, we really wanna focus on the role of bank boards in this context. Specifically, we wanna discuss the credit risk situation currently in the banking sector, take stock of the different regulatory supervised reactions on credit risk management in the context of the pandemic, also look forward, reflect upon banks' operating models, strategies to ensure credit risk monitoring and management after we hopefully will come out of this crisis, uh, after the out of the pandemic at least and then discuss specifically implications for the role of non-executive directors on bank boards in the management of credit risk by bank management so um let me briefly introduce our three speakers uh first um jose manuel campa 
is currently chairperson of uh, the European Banking Authority in uh, Paris. Um, of course, uh, um, Jose Manuel has a long career um, as uh, both in policy making, uh, but actually also before that, a very significant and substantial career in academia. So he's one of these people who really perfectly combines academia and uh, policy making. Um, then we have Clara Yandova, who is a partner in the financial services finance and risk practice of Oliver Wyman, based in Milan, um, regularly advising leading financial institutions and supervisory authorities in Europe on credit risk management. So she can give us a broad picture on both supervision and bank risk management from the outside. Finally, we have, uh, but not least, Francesca Tondi, board member of Unicredit, uh, who sits on the internal risk and control committee and the governance nomination and ESG committee. Uh, Francesca has also a long career in financial services um, uh, across Europe, among others, Morgan Stanley and uh, uh, JP Morgan, and she's going to be able to give us a direct insight from the viewpoint of a um, uh, board member to the, on the issue of credit risk after COVID. Um, just finally, before I give the word to Jose Manuel, um, we're planning to do 12 minutes for Jose Manuel, then eight minutes for each uh, Clara and Francesca to have as much time as possible for Q&A, 20, 25 minutes. Um, we would like to engage, of course, the audience, uh, you, with the speakers. Um, so to do so, please post your questions in the Q&A uh, bar that you can find in the bottom of your screen. Um, I especially um, uh, encourage uh, bank board members that are on this call, on this uh, in the seminar, to ask uh, questions. And of course, I will then pick questions and put them to the uh, to the speakers. Again, I will have a preference for questions related directly to the role of bank board members in the context of credit risk after the crisis. So, long introduction. Over to you, Jose Manuel. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thurston. Thank you for the introduction. It was long, but it was important. Uh, and I, first of all, good afternoon to everybody, uh, to all the participants, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this FBF Board Academy. I'm very happy to be here. And as Thurston said, I'm very happy to collaborate with uh, any academic activities since I consider myself to a high degree and a, a former, hopefully, future academic as well as, we, as, as time evolves. But uh, let me try to stick to the time that Thorsten uh, indicated, 12 minutes, and I'll try to give you uh, a brief assessment from my part on how the situation has evolved from the point of view of, of, credit, of credit exposure in the banking sector, but in the bank's balance sheets, uh, what have been the actions that we have been taking as the European Banking Authority joining with the competing authorities of the member states, and also how do we see the challenges going forward and the main actions that need to be taken by banks and also for us uh, to make sure that we oversee properly. Now, it's, it, I think it's by now it's well understood by everybody that COVID-19 has caused an unprecedented shock to our societies. I think we all agree that this was not an economic crisis, this was a health crisis, but uh, that the measures that have been put in place to address the health challenges have very large economic consequences. You know, and part of one of those large economic consequences, of course, is potential deterioration on the on the financial situation of non-financial corporates, households, and particularly also affecting very vulnerable uh, parts of our society. Now, it's fair to say that I think over the last nine months that we have been living with this crisis, you know, the actions of capital of banks have been supportive to the to the exceptional policy measures, both the monetary and the fiscal part, that have been put by the economic authorities, and they have been helped in that way to alleviate some of the liquidity and uh, needs and funding needs of non-financial corporates and households. Uh, however, economic recovery continues to be high to, subject to a very high level of uncertainty, uh, uh, particularly as we go through, through, through new waves of the COVID-19 pandemic in the, in the different parts of, of the world, but also the European Union. And banks need to remain ready to support the economy and contribute to their economic recovery as time evolves. It's true that uh, in contrast to the global financial crisis, we have seen an increase in lending by banks to the real economy, uh, part of the crisis, you know, 
this lending has been mainly uh, early on in a crisis was mainly driven by uh, extensive use by non-financial corporates of credit lines that had uh, committed uh, but not disposed. They, they drew on those credit lines. Later on in the second part of the year, uh, part, a large part of the credit demand was driven and supported by the extensive public and the schemes that were being put forward by fiscal authorities to support, again, non-financial corporates and also in some cases, households. Throughout this process, uh, banks have remained with very ample uh, capital and liquidity. In fact, when I look at the, at the average ratios of capital corrective tier one for the industry as of, of the end of the third quarter, which is the, the, the number that we have with more from numbers, the, 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 the end of the year results are now being likely to be reported in the coming weeks. But basically looking at September, you know, the average uh, core equity uh, tier one ratio fully loaded was 15.1%, which compares uh, positively relative to the second quarter, which was a slight decline, but also positively relative to the beginning of the year of 2020. So over the nine months, you know, banks were able to lend while preserving capital ratios that were high, partially due to their actions, partially due to the regulatory actions that were put in place, and some of, of course, the alleviation in terms of capital requirements that authorities also put in place. If I look at liquidity, the, the analysis is very, very similar. You know, once we see that the LCR ratio, the liquidity coverage ratio, was over 150% uh, in the third quarter. At the end of the third quarter, uh, slightly higher than in the first quarter, where it was 147%. You Not know, but in any case, well below, well, well above, sorry, the regulatory standard requirements of 100%. You know, and uh, that signals again the exceptional monetary measures that were put in place have been working. As I said, loan growth had increased in the third quarter slightly. You know, I think that it's important. There was an increase in standing loans, and that was mainly due to increase uh, in loans to SMEs and improvement in cash balances due to, due to the accumulative monetary policies. However, it's fair to say at the same time that banks have been hit in profitability. You know, uh, this was already a challenge prior to the crisis. The return on equity of the industry was below the cost of the have been below the cost of equity for a number of years. And uh, although it rebounded slightly, uh, it's, it's slightly sorry, in the third quarter, the ROE average for the industry as of September was 2.5%, which I think most people will argue it remains way below the cost of equity. Now, that uh, was the rebound in, in the, the return equity was partially due to a slight decrease in the cost of risk, but also to an enhancement in the cost to income ratio. You know, of the industry. Now, when we think about the, the, the credit position, and this is uh, what's the current situation of the banks in terms of their credit risk and what's the situation going forward, you know, we have seen that the MPLs have not increased yet. The non-performing loans in the industry have not increased. It's partially due to, obviously, uh, the interaction of the public guarantee schemes. The moratoria have been put in place that have also uh, allowed uh, a number of debtors uh, to remain uh, performing, although because they have no uh, financial obligations, but the question remains whether those, they will be able to confront those financial obligations once the moratoria expire. Banks have increased the share of loans classified under IFRS 9 as a stage two. Now, this has been a significant increase there. Banks have also booked a significant provisions on performing loans in anticipation of an increase probably on the NPL uh, going forward, the, the non-performing exposures. This resulted in a material increase in the cost of risk in the second quarter. You know, although I might say that there are significant differences within the EU across countries and sectors. You know, uh, as you can imagine, you know, uh, the sectors being affected more directly by the pandemics and the ones that also banks are more likely to provision. There are also differences across banking institutions, but the differences across countries are also due to the fact that some of these public guarantee schemes and moratoria are country specific. So the impact that they might have on the on NPLs appearing in the banking sector will differ by country as a result of those more, more public guarantee schemes being different by themselves. Uh, the NPL volumes, in fact, have decreased since, since the end of, of 2019, you know, and the NPL ratio, ratio was driven down to 2.8% relative to 3.1%. Now, what are the actions that we have taken 
to help banks throughout this process. And at the same time that we are taking to monitoring this credit situation as we go forward, because I think it's very important that we continue to, to make sure that banks have uh, adequate provisioning, adequate balance sheet, and also adequate measurement of risks. Of course, early in the pandemic, the immediate actions were providing regulatory flexibility. I mentioned already before the capital and liquidity reduction in some of the capital and liquidity requirements, and also release some of the operational burden on banks to make sure that they focus on servicing their customers. I think that banks proved to be resilient to this process. They proved to be helpful to customers. So in that sense, the overall, I think, uh, reaction of the banking sector to the crisis has been probably, uh, uh, I would summarize it in a very quick, so like positive, not just positive for, for society, but also positive for the banks because it has enhanced also the public perception of the role that they perform in society. As we go forward, and this has been a, a big uh, area of discussion and continues to be, you know, there is this ongoing debate about whether banks will be expected to decrease some of those buffers that they have in terms of capital and liquidity ratios as the crisis evolves and continues some of the APL performance are there. That would be natural. It's always natural that some of those buffers uh, follow a, a cyclical pattern, you know, and as, as, as the economy deteriorates, it's likely that the buffer will decrease. There's a debate about the usability of those buffers, and I think we've been just made messages that within the buffers are there to be used and should be used, and there should not be any stigma attached to the use of those buffers if it's to work through the cycle. It's the normal behavior through the cycle. However, uh, I know that concerns have been raised by a number of stakeholders at some points about whether you know the, 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 the use of those buffers by banks uh, will really have implications in terms of the perception of investors or the perception of supervisors, and we're working with supervisors to make sure that they provide guidance or will be the expected uh, recovery of capital ratios or uh, build up of buffers if needed because they were drawn out throughout the crisis. There were also additional regulatory measures that have helped provide a re release in terms of the quick fix, for instance, in Europe. I would not go into this unless they interest. From our point of view, you know, we have been very active in providing guidelines on how, you know, uh, a moratorium and public guarantee schemes should be utilized within the context of the regulatory framework as well on within the context of the IFRS 9, in particular, you know, to make sure that there's no immediate automaticity that's built in the regulation, there's enough flexibility to, uh, to avoid undue procyclicality. I think those guidelines hopefully have been helpful. As you know, some of our guidelines continue to be in place for moratoria until the, the end of the first quarter of this year for banks. We have also enhanced our reporting and we are requiring banks to provide a detailed reporting on the prevalence of moratoria and public guarantee schemes and we've been publishing or we, and we'll continue to publish quarterly reports on this front uh, as a way to enhance uh, the visibility that stakeholders have on the situation of the banks and the assessment that they can make on the situation of the banks. We'll continue that monitoring going forward. I think that's very important. Uh, another part of our work going forward will focus on the <coughs> making sure that there are adequate mechanisms for banks to manage the potential increase of NPLs. Particularly, you know, the commission came forward at the end of last year with a new NPL strategy. And there are a number of areas there in which we will be supporting the commission, you know, enhancing our te templates on disclosure of NPLs so that there's more facility for banks to be able to engage with investors and maybe sell some of those assets if needed, enhance the regulation and streamline the ratio of also securitizations to facilitate that transition when, when needed. And I think that will continue to be important as we go forward. You know, as of September, just to give you a sense, there were 580 billion euros of loans that were under moratoria. You know, those moratoria were expected to expire, most of them, <coughs> by, this, by the first half of this year. It was widely dispersed. Widely, so the use of the moratoria were widely dispersed. 60% of the loans were for NFS, for non-financial corporates, and 40% for households. There were also 290 billion of loans that were subject to public guarantee schemes, so that were being supported in some form or another by public support, you know, and those, again, I think they're important uh, that we have clarity on what the degree of those support that will imply going forward. Now, if I might just add uh, two more sentences as we think of the way forward, you know, and as I encourage uh, directors, particularly non executive directors, to think about the situation of the individual banks, I think that What's very important is that although the full impact of the pandemic is still to be seen, you know, we need to keep uh, active 
eyes on making sure the fresh credit to uh, appears to be uh, being directed to not just the most affected borrowers, but also to the most uh, salient areas in which the recovery will, will take place as we go forward, that also lending continues to be uh, directed toward those areas of the medium and long term, particularly within the context of the sustainable agenda and the reforms that need to be taking place in, our, in, in the European underlying economy. I think that banks need to perform to, to keep performing comprehensive risk, risk assessments, early recognition of problematic exposures, proactive engagement with borrowers, you know, to make sure that the money is proper, the, the, the exposures properly and adequate provisioning policies. I think all those strategies are essential as we go forward to both guarantee proper allocation of credit, to guarantee credibility on the balance sheets of the banks and the information that's being provided. And in that part, on our side, we'll continue to provide our transparency exercises that we did. We just published a transparency exercise in December. We will launch the new stress test exercise at the end of this month and that exercise will be published in July and that hopefully will provide information to investors and to supervisory authorities on the status of individual banks and the best way going forward and I encourage directors also to, to, to pay attention to those pieces of information as we go forward and then one final thought if I may that beyond the credit risk you know I think that it's also important that uh, directors keep an eye on the long-term strategy and business model of the banks because the Underlying challenges, structural challenges that were in the industry prior to COVID-19. You know, I will mention only three, which was I already talked about low profitability. A second important challenge was the technological transformation that the industry was engaging, was required to engage in. And a third important challenge that I mentioned before is the ESG challenges for the underlying European economy. All those challenges remain and they're probably kind of even more prevalent as a result of COVID-19 rather than disappear. So to keep a focus on the right strategy for the medium long term. It's just as important as managing the credit risk in the short term. So let me stop here and thank you again for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and participate in the debate. Back to you, Torsten. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. That was a great uh, overview uh, of the current situation from uh, the regulatory viewpoint. Maybe I can I ask a very quick follow-up question. I mean, as you said, um, non-performing loans might come show up in banks' balance sheets as we go forward, and you will get a first impression in uh, after the stress test later this year. Uh, now, your predecessor in this position, and uh, currently head of the SSM, has uh, put forward the idea of an AMC, um, which we know have experience on the national level, but there's also the idea of an AMC uh, on the European level. Um, very quickly, what do you think? Uh, is that Should it be part of the uh, agenda? Well, I think that, to be honest, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, existence of AMCs should be clearly part of the agenda. You know, I think that, that Andrea, um, and I, I very much agree with him, he sees benefits in having a European AMC that's homogeneous and that facilitates that, that process of, of transferring assets from the banking sector to, the, to an AMC in a more homogeneous way across Europe. This is, this is an idea that is very dear to the EDA and also to me personally. So I think that we will support that. It's fair to say that, you know, uh, I think that the broad political support for that is low at this stage. And that the commission strategy on the MPL uh, provides uh, ideas for a network of AMC, or at least common criteria and common principles of building this AMC to make sure that there's synergies that could be exploited where possible and also homogeneity in the way assets are being dealt with, valuation techniques and things of that sort that facilitate the investor assessment of those assets and the transfer of those assets from the banking sector to other parts of the financial sector. So we will be helping in that part and think to, to the greater homogeneity that we can achieve, the better. Wonderful, great. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Um, let me turn to uh, Clara and on her introductory remarks, please. Yes, uh, thank you for, for, for this opportunity to present and, uh, and hi to everyone uh, on this seminar. I will talk a bit about the challenges that uh, banks and, uh, and bank boards are facing in this moment, uh, in the current soil conditions, and uh, also a bit about the solutions that, uh, that we see being deployed uh, in the market to address those challenges. So as a matter of introduction, I'd like to say that 2021 is probably going to be very different from what has been seen in 2020 and probably also from what has been seen in uh, any uh, past economic crisis. 2020, with the rise of the pandemic, has uh, been focused for the banks mostly about overcoming the operational challenges in channeling the liquidity to the, to the economy, often while working remotely or with uh, new processes and, and new conditions. 
institutions started to understand and to measure and quantify the impacts of the of this crisis on their credit portfolios but to a great extent uh, the impacts on credit have been protected both by the government measures guarantee schemes moratoria etc 2021 in our view is going to be characterized on the one hand by the continued uncertainty that has been mentioned before about uh, for how long the pan pandemic is going to, uh, to last and what is going to be the path uh, to recovery, hopefully at some point during uh, during this year, uh, there is expected expiration of at least some of the support measures that have been supporting uh, companies and ultimately banks as well uh, throughout the last year. And there is increased need to manage asset quality, credit risk, and, and transparency towards the in, in, uh, towards the investors. So. In this context, we see that the banks and uh, their boards are facing four key challenges uh, and, uh, and evolutions that, uh, that, are, that are impacting them. The first challenge is to understand the, the risks that are in the portfolio and define the, the lending strategy about how the lending portfolio should, should evolve and, and what should change uh, going forward. Second, adjust the criteria that has been used in, in credit process processes, both uh, in terms of new lending and in terms of defining the restructuring solutions. Third, obviously manage the new NPE flows that despite uh, careful risk management are inevitably uh, going to materialize throughout the year. And fourth, quantify the impacts in terms of uh, provisions, uh, asset quality, PNL, balance sheet, and ensure transparency towards this, uh, the investors. So I'm now going to discuss each of those challenges, uh, discussing the drivers and the, and the solutions uh, that uh, are being developed in the industry. So the first one, understanding the risks in the portfolio and adjusting lending strategy. The, the drivers are, I think, fairly obvious. First, there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, on how 2021 and the years that are going and the upcoming years are going to be affected by the, by the pandemics in economic terms. And second, the way how the macroeconomic shock is affecting the credit portfolio is very different from what has been seen in past. Uh, for example, even though the economy is shrinking, GDP is shrinking, shrinking, there are sectors that are actually performing really well and that are growing. For example, e-commerce, IT. There are sectors that are much worse off than, uh, than the, the average. For, for instance, of course, tourism, restaurants. But even within those sectors that are worse off, there's quite a lot of difference based on the actions that have been taken by companies' management. Uh, for instance, for a restaurant chain, if there has been a good transition to a delivery model, the impact is going to be much lower than for the same business that didn't take this action. So understanding how the economic crisis is going to affect the credit portfolio and where the key vulnerabilities lie both in terms of single names or of the, of the sectors is a, is a key challenge uh, for banks and, and their boards. And the solutions that we see developing is uh, development of dedicated methodologies that integrate somehow the traditional macroeconomic models uh, to, to understand the vulnerabilities that help to translate the sector impacts and single name impacts at a more granular level. And also considering the uncertainty that still exists about how things are going to evolve, uh, another solution is uh, to not to build only one scenario, but to build multiple scenarios. And I think boards in their role of, of oversight should insist on having visibility of how things can evolve and what are the key risks in the portfolio under different scenarios of how the pandemic and government measures are going to evolve going forward. A second challenge is adjusting the criteria for credit risk assessment, whether it is uh, in a new underwriting or uh, in restructuring decisions. And the driver of this is that uh, the traditional methods to assess credit are often based on uh, data and information that is not relevant in the current context. If you are going to assess new lending based on the financials from 2019, if you are going to look at uh, payment behavior in 2020, where there was more moratoria, so actually no repayments were, were asked, uh, you are not going to get a good picture of what is the liquidity need of the customer and what is uh, the ability uh, to repay the debt. 
So here, the solutions that we see in the market is uh, use of new information and the use of new methodologies. This can be on the one hand, uh, use of sector level projections to adjust uh, the old financials to get a more, more accurate picture, or even use of uh, different data sources, looking for instance on current account transactions to reconstruct an almost uh, real time cash flow analysis of the customer going beyond uh, the information that has traditionally been used. And I think here the message for the board members would be to challenge the management uh, to make sure that these evolutions in uh, credit risk assessment criteria is, is happening and that uh, new information and more up-to-date information is being used. Uh, third challenge is uh, managing NP flows. It has been said that, uh, of course, despite all uh, risk management measures, uh, there is going to be an, an increase in NPs going, going forward. And uh, there's a lot of awareness, I would say, in the industry that it is important to prepare for that. Uh, so develop a sort of NP strategy defining how these new NP volume, volumes are going to be dealt with, whether internally outsourcing, securitizing, selling, and also how to assess the customer situation and the actions that can be taken. So is it going to be a restructuring? Is it going to be a debt forgiveness? Is it uh, going to be uh, a liquidation, for instance? So having the, a clear connection between customer situation, customer liquidity needs, repayment capacity, and the action to be taken uh, in order to uh, maximize the value both for the customer and for the bank of, of this situation. In terms of solutions, we see quite a lot of differences between so-called high NP countries that have faced this problem very recently and therefore have mostly the infrastructure in place in terms of organizations, processes, decision making that are now focusing on adjusting this to the new situation on the one hand. And on the other hand, are facing maybe the problem of dealing with really huge volumes in the sense that the new NPs are not going to be the only problem they have, they still have some NP stock that needs to be needs to be dealt with. So there's there's maybe an issue of capacity, both internal and from external players, about how big NP volumes can be can be absorbed. Uh, in low NP countries, it is uh, I wouldn't say a new problem, but a problem that has been much less relevant in the past and that has taken a lot of uh, relevance today. And uh, there is a lot to be built in terms of organization processes and toolkit to make sure that uh, these NPs are managed efficiently. And uh, as we said already before, in addition to individual actions that bank can take, there's also a lot of debate uh, on building system-wide solutions, whether it is uh, European bad bank, national solutions, or even maybe schemes facilitating the access of uh, private investors in, uh, in this market. So here, I think the message for board members is to make sure that they have visibility about the NP through the strategy being defined and providing challenge to the, to the management on this topic. A fourth challenge is quantifying impacts on asset quality, PNL, capital position, and uh, providing transparency to the, to the investors. There's a consensus that uh, the risk models will require updating. So risk models used both to quantify provisions in the IFRS 9 scheme or the IRB models quantifying uh, capital, uh, capital requirements are based on data that, uh, that is old and are often based also on macroeconomic conditions that, uh, that are not, no longer the current ones. Uh, in the short term, this, has, this is being managed mostly by qualitative overlays and uh, expert interventions to model output, uh, but there is of course the, the awareness that uh, also more structural changes to the models are going to be required going forward. And uh, I think in terms of the solutions, of course, risk management of banks are working on this. On the other hand, there's also high expectation uh, on the role of supervisors working on promoting transparency, for example, with the EBA stress test exercise, but also on providing guidance about how the methodologies should be, should be evolving uh, going forward. So yeah, that's uh, that's the, the overview of, uh, of challenges that we see in the banking industry and uh, that have implications for the for the board one members as well. So I'll hand over here to, to Torsten for the next uh, next intervention. 
Thank you very much, Clara, for this um, uh, very clear overview. Um, let me ask you a very quick uh, follow-up question. I mean, you mentioned this kind of uh, that um, we have to start planning now uh, for uh, non-performing exposures. Um, um, but how, do, how long do you think it will take until the banks have a clear view on uh, their non-performing exposures? Um, um, will it be this year? Will it be next year? How long? When, when do we can expect the bank? And I'm not talking again the regulators. I'm talking from the banks itself, management, board members. When will they have a clear picture? I think it depends a lot on when they start <laughs> and uh, also about how the, the conditions evolve in the sense that there are banks that already have maybe not one clear picture, but they or that already have pictures based on how the situation is going to evolve about what is going to be in the NP stock. Uh, they have also a view on how many people they are going to need in the restructuring departments and what is going to be the best strategy in terms of uh, internal versus, versus external. There are, bank, there are other banks that maybe have not done that much of preparatory work. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a priority for them, uh, them this year. But I think kind of having the clear picture, for having the clear picture, I think there's clearly of one, one clear picture, meaning that that's going to be the, <laughs> what happens and not only the scenarios. There needs to be a bit more certainty about uh, the, both the macroeconomic evolution mm -hmm. and second on the, on the support measures. Because of course they have been extended now, but I think it's still, no one can really tell. Are they really going to expire and uh, when and how and what, are, what the impacts are going to be? You're throwing the ball back into uh, Jose Manuel's court. Very nice. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> um, Clara. Let me turn to uh, Francesca now, um, our board member. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, Torsten, and thank you both Jose Manuel and Clara for uh, you know very interesting insights in the, in, in both uh, presentations. So um, I'm going to talk as, as as I said as a board member sitting on a board of a, of a bank, and I think it's good to see that for the banking sector, as Jose Manuel was saying, at least the banking sector has gone into this crisis with a good capital base. Uh, I think, you know, to, to start with, clearly where we are challenged here now is on the business and the business model and the profitability. And it's something that has to be borne in mind as we, you know, as, as we sit on boards and, and think about the, the, the current situation. Um, I'm going to talk about the board key responsibilities around credit risk, you know, with the impact and the strategy, and then some of the challenges that we are facing right now. Uh, and in terms of responsibilities, I look at three buckets, business and strategy considerations, accounting and disclosure considerations, and regulatory considerations. Uh, and on the business side, I think the first issue that the board has had to consider this year is how um, is the bank's risk appetite changing with the crisis with COVID? Uh, and what is the impact on business? Um, I think one of the first points has been, uh, you know, considering the clear trade-off that has been between capital preservation for the banks, business preservation and profitability, which needs to be considered even more carefully than normally that would be in normal times and require very careful calibration. Um, because ultimately as banks, we need to preserve capital, we need to stay open for business as well. Uh, and that I think is an important consideration. Um, also, so clearly the, the current situation has had an impact on our underwriting stance, how we look at credit, and also how we look at pricing for clients. So this is something that the board has actually also had to consider and debate uh, with, with management. Um, and another critical area of attention for the board has been also its oversight of systems and controls and compliance around moratoria and use of government guarantees, which is normally something that wouldn't come into the lending process. And clearly, it, these are new elements that we have to uh, gain comfort that have been uh, introduced you know, correctly into the systems. Uh, and then there is all, all the area of loan monitoring, loan classifications, eventually NPL management, which is also issues that we need to debate. And how do we, look, you know, how do we think around all this? And uh, I would actually say, you know, what they, my, you know, previous speakers have mentioned, the importance of how do we think, um, you know, in, in terms of risk modeling, how this is impact risk modeling, how technology and data are impacting all this. And I think this is the time when banks have to look at the use of technology and data a little bit more and the use of data in, in the current environment. Um, and I think how we build all of this into the lending decision, into the risk appetite that the bank has. Um, when it comes to accounting and disclosure considerations, again, um, the key issue here is loan evaluations, credit provisions in the account, which require even more significant judgments than is usual. 
Um, so the board has to be really consciously involved in these discussions, which require more attention. Uh, and also through RFRS 9 and, and in the current times, I think this is becoming even more so a cross-functional exercise between risk, finance, account, and business functions. So there are cross-functional implications here that are important that the board considers. Um, and also, obviously, when it comes to accounting, there are disclosure implications, especially around, I would say, the scenarios that we're using, because ultimately with IFRS 9, there's a lot of scenarios, you know, analysis that's been used for loan evaluation, classification and, and provisioning. Um, when it comes to regulatory considerations, I think what all that we have discussed impacts all of the three pillars on the regulatory side. So, you know, the obvious uh, uh, consideration is that IFRS 9 requires, you know, earlier and stronger provisioning, which impacts earnings, it impacts capital, so pillar one considerations, um, but also credit risk models and the way we're going to use them and adjustment will impact ZREP, so, ZREP, so pillar two, um, and also the increased complexity on expected credit losses will also have an impact on disclosure, which is back on pillar three. And I think it's important that we really think organically um, through the various you know, pillars that uh, you know, the, the regulatory um, system is using. And I would like also through all this, make a consideration of governance. I think through all of these activities, the role of the risk and audit or risk and control committee um, is crucial for the work that is being done and for the uh, additional analysis that the committee has been able to use to be more flexible and uh, you know, uh, more attentive to some of these matters during the year and the way that the committee can then in turn support the board in going navigating these issues and navigating these debates. And I think it's important that we recognize that. Um, when it comes on the challenges, uh, I, I'm going to focus especially about the challenges. Uh, I've talked about the business challenges, but also given that is, you know, end of year, you know, closing accounts, loan evaluation and provisioning, I think in the current situations are very, you know, prominent issues. Um, and I would say there's many, you know, I'm looking at mostly three issues. One is the issue of judgment in the loan evaluation and provisioning. Then is the issue of comparability of data. Um, you know, that we're using. And then there are broader implication on business of the um, decisions that we are taking on evaluation and provisioning. Um, you know, for example, you know, when it comes to the issue of judgment, um, there are several points of attention here. So first of all, how do we reconcile IFRS 9 requirements with regulatory requirements, but also with monitoring and government guarantees? And I think the board has to have an oversight around all that and how management deals with that. And I think has to have you know important conversations on, on, uh, on all that. Um, there is also you know how do we think about the cliff effect going forward when moratorium guarantees uh, will expire, and how you know actually we are bringing that into our you know uh, discussion and, uh, and strategic considerations. Um, on also one area that where the board has to have a clear understanding is IFRS 9 and the potential volatility that it introduces in the accounts, something that we knew when IFRS 9 was, you know, uh, you know brought into you know, existence, but it's clearly becoming uh, more important now. Um, you know, we're still not talking about the full loans, loans increasing that much, but provisionings are going up. Just to give an idea, I was looking at the provisioning levels that the European banks put through in the accounts in the first nine months of the year. And if you look on average, 40 to 50% of the provisions taken so far are on stage one and stage two loans. Stage three actually is not that much yet. And so as a board, how do we think about provisioning in that way? You know, we're anticipating, uh, but also we need to be careful not creating too much volatility. Um, another, you know, comment some of the American banks have started reporting, you know, Q4, provisions are dropping really fast. Are there going to be right backs already? How do we think around all that, around the timing? I think it's important. I think we also look at the regulators, um, you know, uh, to give us also some, you know, thought and guidance. Um, I think it's quite important. Um, you know, clearly there's a lot of judgment uh, in uh, included in all this, and I think we have to be conscious. One area where clearly there's a lot of adjustment is, you know, scenario analysis. We have to have really robust scenario analysis. I think it's important that the board challenges management on that. Um, but one of the, you know, clearly um, areas, um, you know, on that is that um, there is also little comparability. I'll talk about it later in scenario analysis. How do we think around it? Um, and, you know, 
I was saying earlier, loan evaluation and provisions don't just impact the PL, they impact risk squared assets, risk density, capital, ultimate threat, but also the link back to business decisions. So I think it's very important as a board that we're looking at uh, a provisioning that we think you know, very much around the whole circle. Then there's a point that I was mentioning earlier, comparability of data. I think that remains key. I think a lot of work has been done on provision and credit risk. The areas where perhaps I see less comparability right now is scenario analysis. What are banks using? What are they expecting? In the stress test, the EBA is very good at saying, you know, I'll give you the scenarios that you can actually start with. How do we think around comparability that for the scenarios they'll be using now? I think it's a you know, big question mark. Um, and also, how do we think about comparability of NPL trends and targets? I mean, clearly, these are business decisions, um, but, you know, what are the regulatory expectations and guidance? Uh, you know, for example, are banks expected to start putting out targets for NPLs management going forward? Very few do. So how do we think around that? And obviously, there are the broader implication of provisioning, especially on business, implication on lending decision, we has to be debated, you know, um, but also, which are linked to loan provisionings, but also NPLs. How do we think about sale versus workout? These are strategic decisions, you know. For example, one of the risks is that when NPLs are fully provisioned, it's just easy to sell. Is it economical? Does it make sense? And um, also, do bank have the correct um, setup, um, skills, infrastructure um, to actually manage the NPLs? What can we do you know, in that respect? How can we get better, uh, you know, to what extent also NPL management by banks will influence the threat process? I think that also is something that you know, can be debated. Um, and as a final point that I would say, regulators I think have been incredibly proactive and helpful um, you know, throughout this year also. Um, you know, one um, you know, caution that I would say is uh, we have to be careful that regulatory requirements and expectations might not focus or steer the board towards too much detail analysis, but rather that we stay on strategic and business consideration, and high level oversight. Sorry for having gone a couple of minutes over, but I'm done. Thank you very much, Francesca, very helpful. Um, now both, uh, and actually I think, I think all three of you mentioned uh, the wording of uh, board members challenging management. Um, but let me kind of be a bit more, ask a more specific question. What exact steps should non-executive board members like you take to effectively control or help controlling a bank's uh, credit risk, again, without, as you just mentioned, going into too much details. Yeah, but uh, first of all, is that for me, Thorsten? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, first of all, I think we have to, uh, um, you know, consider uh, two points. One, that all of these are cross-functional exercises. These are exercises that the, you know, the board and the committee have to debate and sit around the table with the CRO, the CLO, head of finance, you know, even head of internal audit. So it's important that the bank at this moment really debates issue across functions because anything that we decide impacts, uh, you know, every aspect of the bank. And then secondly, that we put everything back into business, into what matters. Uh, and ultimately, even as I was saying earlier, even provisioning ultimately impacts the way we look at risk density, the way we price loans to clients, and therefore the way we're open for business. Uh, and I think these are the areas that I think it's important to debate, but also you know, think broader and, and wider. Do we need to upgrade our you know, technology investments to help us deal with these issues better? Do we need to look at data in a different way? So these are some of the areas that I think the board and committee can help management by challenging management in some of the broader decisions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me turn back to Jose Manuel, maybe. Is there, you have any specific reactions from uh, the viewpoint of, uh, of Francesca as a board member, maybe also what she said at the end uh, in terms of looking at the big picture, not, at the, not always the nitty gritty details? Yeah, I mean, no, I really enjoy very much the comments that were made, you know, and particularly the emphasis of Francesca on two aspects, which I think is important. One is that non-executive directors are, are non-executive. They're not there to take the role of executives. They're there to challenge and they're there to, to give guidance and, and make sure that there is a proper execution on the strategy decisions that were taken by the board. To me, coming back to your question, Thorsten, on particularly the area of credit risk, is I think it's like setting the risk appetite of the bank and making sure that the risk appetite is executed properly by management. It's a key component, particularly in the area of credit risk, you know, uh, not just of risk overall, but of credit risk, you know, it's a key component 
and role of the bank board and that the directors need to be very well conscious of what is the risk appetite, how is the risk appetite being executed, how is it being monitored, should it be changed as a result of COVID, should it be changed as a result of what we think the medium and long-term goals or strategies of the bank are, you know, like when I think, for instance, in a, in a completely different uh, context, which is in, in the ESG strategy of banks. Mm. We're pushing directors and banks to think about what's your risk appetite? How do you see the bank? And this is not for the next six months, this is for the next two decades probably. But if you want to be somewhere in two decades in that arena, you need to start working today. You know, so I think that's the part in which, for me, the non executive directors have, have a crucial role to play, all the board overall. And then, of course, all the other challenges that Francesca was highlighting that is very important. Do we have the right technology? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right teams? Are we, are we asking the right questions uh, within our teams, making sure is the proper governance being implemented internally? I think those are all relevant questions as well. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. Um, maybe a question uh, uh, from the Q&A box um, uh, to uh, Clara. Um, now, is there evidence on how well banks are prepared internally to handle large volumes of defaulted exposures, in particular, or exposures that are likely to default, I would add here, in particular, uh, in previously low NPE countries, um, and uh, specifically with regards to the standards of the 2017 ECB and EBA standards on uh, NPL management? But it's a really good question. And I think the situation varies a lot. Like there's not only a distinction between low NPL and high NPL countries, but also in terms of, uh, you know, status of the preparation. So for the internal, let's say, restructuring units, there's, I think, a lot of awareness that they will need to be strengthened in terms of staff. There are banks already that started to do some resourcing plans, shifting people from the business and from loan origination to, to restructuring. There are others selecting uh, support from external providers. So yeah, I would say there's both in the high NP and low NP countries, because high NP countries, of course, have these structures, but it is not said that they are sufficiently staffed to deal with the current NP stock and with the new flows. There are different degree, degrees of preparation with some banks that have already uh, sized the resourcing need and started to fill it in. Uh, others that still are at early stages of, uh, of design. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Clara. Um, let me uh, ask a question, a follow up question to Fl uh, Francesca. Um, and again, I'm, I'm kind of keep pushing you on this, uh, the role of uh, non executive board members. Um, how can boards be comfortable that the public sector credit enhancement, like the, well, the guarantees specifically, that uh, were also mentioned uh, by uh, Jose Manuel, um, are correctly incorporated in, uh, in uh, risk models and in provisioning? Yeah, th thank you for that. I think it's also very important. And I think it's very much in discussing in management, and this was done very early on, huh? uh, not <laughs> by now, it has to be largely done, but very much how those were being incorporated in credit decision, how the whole credit process and system has been modified to take into account um, you know, these various components, how they're looking at risk modeling and incorporating those. Um, so I think these are the sort of, you know, some of the debates that we need to have with management. And I think, again, it's important that when we have these debates, we have all function around the table. Uh, because everybody has an input, you know, whether there is also compliance, controls, whether it's internal audit. And I think we need to understand how all the considerations have been taken into account and what has been modified and what they are expecting, but also how are they back testing once they're in place? How are they monitoring afterwards that actually, you know, what has been put in place, you know, works? Because clearly there's going to be a lot of attention here, also from a compliance you know, point of view, it's going to be very, very, you know, important. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. Let me ask a question to Jose Manuel. Um, now, um, you mentioned, so we, we've been talking a little bit about um, all of these um, public support measures being put in place, uh, guarantees, moratoria, and so on. And we know there has to be an exit eventually. Uh, we know also that, of course, as a result of that, the, uh, um, uh, the non-performing exposures that are currently hidden um, are kind of um, will come out. Um, how do you see this from the regulatory side? And again, also with, uh, with respect to coordinating with bank boards, um, or to talking to bank box, the, the coordination between these uh, two, to these two uh, um, developments that happen, happen, have to happen at some play point that might, might, might not happen synchronously. 
Yeah, I mean, this is, to be honest, it's, I'm happy that we're focusing the conversation on this aspect because this is the real novel aspect of the current crisis from the point of view of the banking sector. It's not just that we're going through a large crisis and economic cycles that happened in the past. And, and, the, and the banks are really good at assessing, obviously, and the underlying risks uh, that, that, that the counterpart may have. But what's really novel now uh, for the next few months is that there's this new phenomenon, which is the exceptional fiscal measure that we're putting in place and the prevalence of these public guarantee schemes and moratoria. And how to assess those properly will have implications not just for banks across the board, I'll give you, uh, but also important policy implications. Uh, for instance, you know, the guarantees are, are, are the moratoria are different in nature depending on the counterparty and also depending on the country in many places. So the impact that each one of those guarantees may have on the banking sector will be very different for the same external shock, you know, for the same, let's say, if, I, if I'm looking at a at a non-financial corporate, they said the same situation in two different member states, but has benefit from different public guarantee schemes. The impact of the pub on, on the on the bank's balance sheet will be different. And furthermore, if I go a little bit further down the road, you know, many of these uh, current loan situations will require restructuring. Some restructuring that in some cases may go through liquidation, otherwise, other, other, otherwise may just be better that it's only order restructuring of the liabilities because the company remains with a viable business model, it just has too much time. How will, how will that play both in the insolvency procedures, but also just in the, in the private negotiation? What will be the role of the private agents, call it the bank, which one of the lenders, but also what will be the role that the, thing, the state will take on the use of the guarantee and what will that guarantee take place? Those are very important discussions that need to take place you know, to make sure that we have orderly restructuring. And we, we don't end up with destroying more of the productive capacity that is really needed. There's already going to be a lot of the structural productive capacity because the crisis has implications. But we want to make sure that through this process of the interaction of the lenders, the banks, the companies, and the involvement of the stake in the, through these mechanisms, it's not an, it, it ends up being efficient. And we already know there are very large differences in the insolvency procedures across the EU and how those insolvency procedures work. So that's going to be a very difficult challenge going forward. Thank you. And Thorsten, if I may, just to you know, uh, add something here. Uh, I think what is important, again, there should be in place by now, a series of KPIs that actually take all of this into consideration. You know, how the guarantees, you know, how many we're receiving, how we're evading them, how we're treating them, what are the exceptions? So the board needs to find, you know, effectively a data board of the KPIs to monitor these specific issues. And I think this is very important that we work on those. Uh, and also, um, as is our case, for example, when you have a very diversified international franchise, how do we take into account and we interlink all of the moratorium guarantees rules that are coming in different countries? And again, monitoring all that, I think, is going to be very crucial as well. Um, Thank you. Um, if I may, maybe if, if it's okay with everybody, uh, we can just continue for another five minutes since you also started a little bit late, if that is okay with you. Um, actually, I have a follow-up question for Francesco on that, and you kind of uh, was, were almost uh, anticipating one of my questions. I mean, Unicredit, and I'm not going to talk about Unicredit per se, but is one of many uh, cross-border banks. And uh, you just mentioned the, uh, the cross-border implications, and the, uh, of course, Clara has mentioned the, uh, the variation in uh, guarantee programs and also preparedness uh, across uh, uh, different jurisdictions in the European Union. What additional uh, kind of challenges that is posed, especially for, for board members? You mean the, the, the cross-border implications in that? Uh, I mean, clearly, it, it, when you have an international franchise and your loan, loan book is spread across many countries, I think that you know, clearly it requires you know, careful calibration because both the impact of COVID in the current situation on the economic uh, environment, um, the government response, and the way the business is being run changes uh, you know, by country. So what is the key at the moment is that we have sufficiently ro robust central standards that actually uh, ensure commonalities of policies and procedures, but coupled with local considerations because each country is different and the regulation is different and the, the, the economic situation is different. So coupled with that to make sure that actually we capture those uh, and take those into consideration when it comes to risk aggregation, when it comes to the overall risk appetite and the way we, we run the business. So I think that is the debate and that is the tension that we have to navigate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Clara, are you seeing from your experience uh, over the past 10 months, uh, uh, specific challenges for the European cross-border banks, larger ones especially? 
Yeah, I think I would echo what Francesca said uh, said before. So they're also dealing with different measures in different countries, dealing with different situations, and also probably internally dealing with a different degree of preparedness in the different uh, different processes that, mm -hmm. that also vary across in the institutions. So, so addressing that, and I would also echo very much the, the solution to that, uh, which is having common standard and the possibilities uh, to tailor this standard to specific situations in each country. Thank you. Let me um, maybe end with a question for Jose Manuel. Um, so it was mentioned uh, that it's important to avoid the cliff edge effect, which we just talked about. Um, uh, once the, the moratoria and the government measures expire, um, don't you think that the EBA with its recent guidance, I'm reading your question, where it states that the previous easing measures do not apply for exposures which spent more than nine months in moratorio, send a clear message to the banking sector that it's time to speed up the building of provisions now? Well, uh, to be honest, yeah, I think that was the intention. You know, I think that the important, the important message here when we extended these moratorium guidelines, I think is that, you know, uh, a moratorium guideline is it's, it's a moratorium on liquidity. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moratorium supposedly, it's a provision of liquidity. It's not a, a manner to try to avoid recognizing is solvency concerns or, or credit worthiness concerns, you know, and banks should try to recognize credit worthiness concerns when they see that there's either objective evidence. And of course, when there's moratorium, it's difficult to see that objective evidence because there's no need for the debtor to make any payments. Or when there's objective evidence and sufficient evidence, and, and they should be uh, preventing that, you know, and that's that's why when we they say, okay, we can extend the moratoria beyond uh, until until the first quarter of this year, but I think there was a strong consensus on the board that would send a signal as well that if you've been in moratorium for nine months, the bank has had sufficient information by now and sufficient time to be able to assess whether on a subjective basis, you may be an increase, you may have experienced a significant increase on your risk profile, and they may take actions as a result of that, you know, and as it was said already, we have seen Increase in provisions on stage one and stage two in IFRS nine, and that's exactly the right way to pro to proceed. You know, it's early signals that you need to in introduce into your assessment. So I think, yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm glad that the question was phrased that way because that was the intention of the measure. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jose Manuel. I think you now uh, kick the ball back into Francesca's court. Um, now, we have already run over time, but I want to give uh, both Francesca and uh, Clara, if they want, uh, the quick opportunity to maybe respond or to have any final remarks. Francesca? Sure. Um, uh, look, uh, I, I touched on that in, uh, you know, in, in, in my you know, uh, initial you know, remarks. And uh, for sure, we need to keep you know, that into mind, the issue of the cliff effect, but that's exactly what we're doing, and IFRS 9 perversely helps with that. So this is not to say that we should be complacent, um, I don't think, you know, but I think on the provisioning side and evaluation, um, these, uh, what, you know, the accounting, you know, uh, uh, standards are, allow us to do actually helps in that direction. Um, to my mind, the most important aspect, however, going forward will also be how we think about data and technology to truly understand which companies are going to be able to survive past the moratoria and those that actually, unfortunately, will not be able to so that we calibrate our lending policies accordingly. Thank you. Clara, any? Yeah, I think it touches upon also on what I was uh, mentioning in my intervention, which is that in the presence of moratoria, there's very little that the bank can do in terms of assessing the credit risk, looking at the traditional information. And therefore, looking at the new data sources, looking at transactions, interviewing maybe the customers for big names is crucial to understand what is actually the liquidity need and the repayment capacity, although I'm currently not observing any, any repayment or any additional liquidity granting because of the moratoria. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for this. This was an exciting discussion. Um, I have this uh, distinct feeling that this is not going to be the, the last uh, word on this uh, in this topic. Um, uh, maybe um, uh, especially on the credit risk and as well, I think, come back in many different uh, um, occasions over the next uh, uh, months and years. Um, let me just say, uh, well, first of all, thank you to our speakers, um, Jose Manuel, um, uh, Clara and Francesca for participating. Uh, thank you for the audience also for asking questions. Um, you might have noticed that I didn't pick up uh, all of the questions in the uh, Q&A. I was focusing specifically on the ones that were related uh, to uh, the responsibility uh, of bank board members, but please be assured this topic will be picked up again 
in other settings outside the Bank Board Academy by seminars of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And of course, some of the topics mentioned will also be picked up in, in, full, in future seminars of, uh, within the Bank Board Academy. So as a final word, um, please uh, check back on our website. Uh, our next uh, seminar for in this series is in February on proper and fit. And of course, the Academy in June and uh, October. And as I mentioned, next week, we have a seminar, an online seminar on big tech and uh, fintech. Again, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for staying with us for this hour. Thank you very much for the speakers for this uh, exciting discussion and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.